Hi and welcome back to a new video. In October I was visiting ASUS in Taiwan to take a closer look at the new AMD Threadripper CPUs. With the recent AMD Threadripper CPUs, AMD now also has CPUs for the workstation area with Zen 4 based cores. And to be more specific, today we are going to look especially at the 7980X, so the 64 core AMD Threadripper. For launch there will be multiple CPUs starting with 24 cores, 32 cores, 64, 96 cores and also different versions when it comes to memory channels. The highest will be the 96 core AMD Threadripper 7995WX which also features 8 memory channels. That's what you can also identify by the WX in the name. Because the CPUs without the WX, for example the 7980X, will only feature 4 memory channels. But with all the experience I could gain during this week, it doesn't really matter as much. So also the big CPUs work totally fine only running four memory channels. Only maybe if you have a very memory intensive workload. Very similar already to Intel's Sapphire Rapids, you may only use RDIMM DDR5 modules with ECC, which will make the entrance cost into the platform a bit more expensive, especially if you're looking at high memory speeds. But let's just start with a quick look at the mainboard. And we are using a very early version of the Asus Pro WS TRX50 Sage Wi-Fi. Okay. And as you can see, the board is pretty much empty when it comes to any kind of cooling or covers. We can only see a small aluminum block on the bottom right, where the chipset is underneath, and also on the bottom left, where we have a 10G network chip. But I have to say that the chipset is a very, very efficient. So even without the cooling block, without the aluminum block, it was working perfectly fine. So when I used it without the heatsink and I touched the chipset, it was still very cold. The voltage supply of this motherboard is extremely interesting and I'm pretty sure you straight noticed how the socket is fully surrounded by power stages and inductor. We are counting a total of 43 phases around the socket. On the left side we can count 23 and on the right side we can count 20 phases. And also there you can read that it's signed with Thestral MOS W. And Thestral is the code name of the motherboard and MOSW is the orientation, so just west of the socket. And out of those 43 faces, if we look at the upper region, so in the center of the socket, we can count four for SOC and three faces for the memory voltage of the CPU or the memory controller. And underneath the socket, we have four faces that are sitting a little bit more separate and those are for VDDIO. Unlike AM5, which is only using a single core voltage, this CPU is supplied by two core voltages, which is pretty interesting, which is mainly caused by the high amount of CCDs. For example, if we look at AM5 and the 7950X, it only consists out of two CCDs. Whereas if we look at the big thread ripper, the 96 core, it contains out of 12 CCDs, and this CPU right here, the 64 core with eight active CCDs, which is just a huge amount of chiplets and also covers a huge surface. So it's just more precise to split up the voltage supply into two core voltages and also allows pretty interesting configurations. Generally speaking though, the CPUs are not that much different from previous Threadripper generations. And also if you look at the SP6 socket, mechanically speaking, it is, I would say, almost identical to the first AMD Threadripper, which I have very good, yeah, experiences with, say it like that. At this point though, I have to point out that I'm more a friend of this AMD socket and solution compared to the Intel solution, simply because I know that the CPU is sitting firmly and safe in the socket and it's not sticking to the heatsink, which just happens way too often on the Sapphire Rapids uh, platform. And yeah, it just happened to me too many times that I'm accidentally bending some pins. So I prefer this solution as long as the carrier frame doesn't break. So I started mounting the CPU in the socket, added some memory and also mounted the AIO to start with my testing. In addition, we also added an Elmore PMD to the motherboard, which allows to check the power consumption during some benchmarks or tests, so we can also take a look at that. And as usual with AMD or current AMD generations, the first boot just takes forever. And on this platform, even longer than what you might be used to with AM5 if you populate all memory slots. I also checked the time for fun on first boot and I had to wait four and a half minutes to be able to access the BIOS the first time. 
Now, obviously, if you're working in the motherboard development department, you have to undergo this procedure many, many times, which also led to ASUS to come up with a special trick, especially for extreme overclockers. So if you enable the LN2 mode, there is also an additional reserved switch on the bottom of the board. And if you flip this, three out of the four memory channels will be disabled. And this drastically decreases the boot time. And now think about it, I'm only using the quad channel mainboard. There's also the octa channel board and if you disable seven out of the eight channels, it will definitely decrease your boot time. With all this initial memory drama in mind, I was honestly surprised how well this platform can handle high memory speeds. I just loaded this XMP profile or in this case called DOCP with 6400 megahertz and it only took one and a half minutes to boot. And that's the second boot, obviously. But checking in Windows, you can see 6400 was instantly applied and even 2000 MHz Infinity Fabric Clock. So AMD definitely did some good work here when it comes to memory clock. So what's the first thing you would do with such a heavy multi-threading CPU? Obviously, it just runs in the bench R23. 98,000 points stock. That is pretty impressive. And that's more than 24900K combined, if you could add this up. And then again, if you compare the power consumption, the 7980X only consumed 350 watt for 98,000 points. Now think about it. A single 4900K gets 41,000 points but consumes 330 watt. So almost the same power consumption, but it's delivering more than twice the performance when it comes to multi-threading. That's just extremely impressive how efficient this CPU is running. Due to the very low core voltage of about 800 millivolts under load, you can also see why the CPU stays that cold with about 50 to 70 degrees Celsius depending on CCD and load. But also looking at Cinebench, we see a clock of about 3.8 to 4 gigahertz under load in Cinebench. But also if you check hardware info, you can see that there is much more potential in the CPU because on six of the cores, we can see a boost of 5.6 gigahertz and on all other cores, we saw a boost of up to 5.3 gigahertz. With those boost clocks in mind, I of course asked myself the question, how will this CPU perform in gaming? And even though this CPU might primarily not be made for gaming, I thought it would just perform pretty well. That's why we're looking at Remnant 2. And in this game, I figured out that the CPU also performs pretty well here. And we can see low temperatures, about 45 degrees Celsius under load, while the CPU boosts to about 4.8 gigahertz across the loaded cores. The rest is idling at a low 2.7 gigahertz, but I also want to point out that there is not even a way for me to display all of the cores here here at the same time. And that's just a typical problem with having 64 cores, aka 128 threads. In this benchmarking scene, we can achieve 110 FPS on average and 65 FPS in the 1% low. This was tested in 1080p resolution and ultra settings. With this setup, we are about 10 to 15 FPS behind a 7950X 3D and about 25% behind a 7800X 3D, just looking at the minimum FPS. But you should keep in mind that we are testing in pretty much the worst case scenario. That means 1080p with a 4090, which results in CPU bottlenecking. And you have to keep in mind that most of the time, if you would have this setup with a 4090, you would probably play in 1440p resolution at least, or probably even 4K. And in the high resolutions, you will not be able to tell a difference between this CPU or any recent AMD desktop CPU. That's why I also tested Assassin's Creed Valhalla in 4K. We can see 74 FPS in minimum and 114 FPS on average. And that is absolutely playable and only slightly behind the recent AMD desktop CPUs. Also, I want to point out that the power consumption during Remnant 2 was on average 144 watt. While this is about twice as much as the recent AMD desktop CPUs, for example, a 7800X 3D, it is still extremely efficient if you take into account how many cores this CPU has, because this is still less than, for example, 14900K. Out of my own personal interest, I also decided to run some Adobe Premiere rendering benchmarks because at this point I was so surprised by how well this platform worked that I'm still considering to buy this for my personal PC, maybe Project Irrationality 2.0, not quite sure about that. So I tested Adobe Premiere and I finished the 4K video rendering with 197 seconds, which is the same performance as a 12900K. And as I already stated in the 14900K review, 
Today, most of the work is done with the GPU if you render with Adobe Premiere, so it doesn't really matter as much, but it performs overall pretty nicely. At this point, I was also thinking maybe there is a way how I can optimize the CPU further and maybe also overclock it for gaming. So I went into BIOS and theoretically you can overclock this CPU per CCX or the individual chiplets. As I pointed out multiple times, the 7980X consists out of eight active CCDs and you can clock them individually, which is pretty easy to do. For example, if we go to BIOS and clock one to five gigahertz. But then again, if we go to Windows, you can see that you are left with the typical AMD problems if you go into the so-called OC mode. This means that you lose all kind of boost functions on all the other chips and you will also lose all kind of power saving features. Without further adjustments, you will actually lose performance if you do what I just did. You can see we're losing about 12k points in Cinebench and also the CPU is now consuming a ton of power. We can see over 500 watt in Cinebench, which is caused by the higher voltage. So I went back into the BIOS to adjust my overclock. You might remember from earlier when I was talking about the split up voltage supply that you have for the left and the right region of the CPU, two individual voltage supplies. This is what we're going to use now. And that's still a disadvantage over Intel's Sapphire Rapids platform because there you can clock every core individually and also individually supply an individual voltage for each core, which is quite amazing. But here we are left with two voltage supplies, so VID0 and VID1 for half of the CPU each. And then I did some further testing and decided to supply 0.9 volt to one half of the cores with four gigahertz. And then the other half of the CPU is going to be supplied with 1.22 volt, which is able to run 5.2 gigahertz across the other 32 cores. Back in Windows, we can see a solid performance increase to 115,000 points, thus an improvement of about 20% when it comes to performance. And we are still in a very acceptable temperature region. As you can see, the quick cores with a high overclock of 5.2 gigahertz reach about 80 to 90 degrees Celsius and the slower cores with 4 gigahertz still sit about 50 degrees Celsius. What's still quite insane though is the power consumption because we're drawing about 500 watts during Cinebench. So now if you're doing this kind of overclock and you want to run some real render benchmark or maybe some render load that takes longer than a few seconds, then I would advise using something else than an AIO because surely this will be saturated quickly. I guess custom water cooling would be the better option. With this overclocking setting in Remnant 2, we can reach 96 FPS in the 1% low and 117 FPS on average. And that is a perfect setting for any kind of daily gaming, especially if you consider that it's only 1080p resolution. And also if you look at the power consumption, it's only 161 watt, which is impressive because the stock was 144 and this is still with the manual overclocking very efficient, absolutely impressive. Obviously we can also clock all the 64 cores of this 7980X to 5.2 gigahertz. For this I had to slightly increase the VID of rail one. So we are running 1.22 volt on the one half and 1.23 volt on the other half. And this results in a Cinebench score of 120. 8,000 points. That is really impressive. It's about 30% improvement that you can easily do. So now keep in mind that an Intel 3495X 56 core can also achieve this score, but it needs liquid nitrogen. And there is no way that you can do it with water cooling and for sure not with AIO. Then I was having some very stupid thoughts again because the 7980X consists out of eight active CCDs. And I thought, why not just disable seven out of the eight cores per CCD and basically create the biggest eight core in existence. And that is possible with a slightly hidden menu in AMD overclocking. There is something called bitmap, which allows you to disable or enable the cores per CCD. And now it's getting really interesting. So just think about it. We now have this massive CPU that runs with one active core per chip. So we have a huge area to dissipate the heat. Heat. So I said 1.3 volt and 5.5 gigahertz because I thought that should work, right? Now check out the temperatures. We can only see 60 degrees Celsius and with this clock and voltage, that's pretty cool. If we compare the performance, it is above a 7700X that also runs with eight cores, but eight cores on a single chip. And with additional tuning, I was able to run all those CCDs between 5.5 and 5.7 gigahertz, depending on the individual chip quality. And as expected, CCD0 was running the best. 
I was able to reach 20,900 points with this. But what about gaming? Interestingly, the performance did not really change, at least compared to our manual 5.2 GHz overclock. We are sitting at 71 FPS in 1% low and 121 FPS on average. You can probably explain this because we are now forcing the CPU to use the chiplets and they have to communicate with each other. Whereas if we are running stock condition or the manual 5.2 GHz from earlier, only the CCD0 is used, so the, basically the entire game runs on one chiplet. Whereas now we force the CPU to use all the chiplets to communicate with each other, which also introduces additional latency between the chips. But considering that, it was working amazingly well. Of course, I was visiting ASUS mainly to also do some extreme overclocking on the side, which I also wanted to do with the new AMD Threadripper CPU. But you have to keep in mind, we have Zen 4 cores here and there were no changes expected over maybe AM5. And we know from AM5 that around 6 GHz most of the CPUs max out. And that's what we also can see here with the new AMD Threadripper. I was able to clock the CPU to 5.9 GHz at 1.5 volt, and this way achieve a score in Cinebench of 140,000 points. At this point also keep in mind that if I'm doing this kind of stuff right here, I'm also using OBS screen recording in the background, which usually steals a few percent of the performance. So keep that in mind if you ever compare my performance numbers. By the way, in this state, the CPU consumed 930 watt power. And also to sum this all up, if we go back to gaming in Remnant 2 on average with the 5.9 GHz overclock, we can see 132 FPS and also 82 FPS in the 1% low. At the end of the week, Elmore also teamed up with Shamino to run the 96 core AMD Threadripper on an Octa channel motherboard, so with 8 DIMMs, to try to achieve a new Cinebench record. And especially considering the base performance of this platform with 96 core, we quickly knew that we should aim for 200,000 points. Above 190,000 points was pretty easy to do at about 5.9 GHz, but above that and closing into 200,000 points, not so easy to be honest. What I found personally quite impressive though is that Cinebench R23 at this speed and this amount of cores only takes about 3 seconds. If we take a look at Elmore's PMD while running the benchmark at these kind of settings, we can observe power consumptions around 1600 watts. And this also explains why those boards allow to use two PSUs. And in this kind of state, that's definitely recommended. Because if we observe 1600 watt on a PMD, the spikes in power consumption will definitely be higher. Meanwhile, Elmore and Shamino had to set up the system multiple times because, you know, at those temperatures, things just don't work out every single time. You have a lot of condensation and everything. But eventually, they were able to break the record. Over 200,000 points. And honestly, I'm really sorry for the bad focus in exactly this moment. But you can see in Benchmade that we have 201,501 points. And the CPU was running between 5.9 and 6 GHz for this result. I also want to point out, at the time shooting this video, the current record in Cinebench R23 was at about 150,000 points. And keeping that in mind, it's insane what kind of performance leap AMD was able to provide with this generation. Honestly, flying to Taiwan, I was not sure what to expect because typically I have mixed relations with AMD Threadripper. They were yeah, very annoying when it comes to memory tuning. I was often not a fan of the socket and so on, but this generation really surprised me. It worked so extremely well. I had a ton of fun with this platform and I might use this even as my new daily. That's still something I have to consider. Alright, that's it for this video. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.